Hello, good evening. Um, I call this April 12th, 2022, virtual administrative meeting of the Bernalillo County Commissioners to order. We will have a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by myself. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, Madam County Manager, are there any changes or additions to the agenda? Madam Chair and Commissioners, good evening. Uh, we do not have any changes or to additions to the agenda. Thank you. Wonderful. We're going to start off with item number four, proclamations, and we have National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week, um, sponsored Vice Chair Benson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, before I um, read out the acknowledgement, I just wanted to um, just give a shout out to the uh, our emergency response department. Um, I had the honor of uh, sitting in uh, uh, going through a tour of their facility and, and sitting in on, on their operations and meeting several of the staff. And I highly recommend it. Um, that is a, that is an operation and they're dealing with a lot of stress and, uh, I was thoroughly impressed. So, so it's my honor now to read this. So Acknowledgement, Bernalillo County Board of Commissioners does hereby acknowledge National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week, April 10th through the 16th, 2022. Emergency communications is the vital link between the community and fire and rescue, police officers and emergency medical services, ensuring the quick response of emergency personnel to protect the public and ensuring emergency personnel receive continuing and correct information to maintain their safety. Effective communications with the public has remained even more critical now during the pandemic with an increase of 911 calls for service that rose 7%. Started by the Contra Costa County Sheriff's Office in California in 1981, National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week is celebrated during the second week of April to honor public safety telecommunications personnel nationwide. The Bernalillo County Emergency Communications Department and its 911 operators exhibit compassion, understanding, and professionalism in each interaction with the public, leading to the apprehension of criminals, suppression of fires, and treatment of patients. During those trying times, the safety of our emergency responders is especially dependent upon the accuracy of information obtained from calls to our emergency communicators to protect law enforcement officers, firefighters, and paramedics responding to possible encounters people positive for COVID-19. The Board of County Commissioners thus acknowledges April 10th through the 16th, 2022 is National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week and extends gratitude on behalf of the community for the dedication of the Bernalillo County Emergency Communications Department staff. Thank you. And just to reiterate, um, I got to sit through a few phone calls and it was, uh, they were a wide extreme. One was a, um, a frightened mother who was racing home from divorce court when uh, the uh, other parent uh, was uh, prohibited from seeing children had already gotten to the home and was holding the children. So the, the lady responder was able, I was, I was about to have a heart attack listening to this phone call. The, the responder kept calm was communicating with the mother, with the uh, sheriff's deputy who was on his way, um, and everything uh, worked out uh, by the end. The, the father of the children had, had given the children back to the mother and was leaving. The mother was safe in the house with locked doors. Um, I didn't have a heart attack, but I was this close. And then the, the uh, transponder or the responder hung up took another call instantly. And this time it was a, a, a wife who was worried because her husband wouldn't wake up on the bed. And from those extremes, and the responder was able to respond 
answer that phone call with hardly a breath in between. Meanwhile, I'm like a, a pool of nerves in the chair right next to her. So um, it, it's a very impressive role and super important. And I think we just take it for granted that people can call 911 and, and other somebody will answer the phone and everything gets taken care of. Um, these, these employees and professionals deserve our respect. So they have it from all of us on behalf of the county commission. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Benson, Vice Chair. Um, yes, so excited. We rely on you um, and thank you for your service. Agree. Wonderful. Um, we have another proclamation. Um, Commissioner O'Malley, did you? Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask for a deferral on this. There were about 50 people from the school coming, parents and teachers, and and they wanted to, um, you know, be there in support of the team. And so we just decided to defer it so that uh, the next meeting they can, they can be there. It was really exciting for them. And so that's what we're going to do. So I guess I'll move a deferral if that's necessary. Second. Second. All in favor, uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. O'Malley. Yes. Mr. Casada. Aye. Commissioner Biscotti. Aye. Vice Chair Benson. Aye. Madam Chair Barboa. Aye. Thank Good call. you. Look forward to meet, seeing them all next meeting. Um, and another uh, exciting proclamation by the county manager for National County Government Month. County Manager Baca. Good evening, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, I believe that there is a proclamation and I know that we talked about a little earlier. Um, I would like for um, Tia to go ahead and discuss um, kind of what's been going on. And um, I, would you like to read the proclamation, Tia? I don't have it in front of me <laughs> wasn't prepared to read it um don't know if i can pull it up okay all right if you'd like me to i can try to do that and Let's see here. sorry t i didn't mean to put you on the spot that's okay let's see And Madam Chair, I was just wondering, I know that Lee um, was on the call. He's the director for communications or, or was in the meeting. And then I don't know that I see him anymore, but I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, there he is, Lee Thompson, that he's um, he's the director. And I wasn't sure if he really wanted, to, if he wanted to say a few words regarding the, tele the communications proclamation. Yes, I was wondering, I thought that might be him, Mr. Lee Thompson. I'd love to hear from you and definitely want to thank you specifically. You want to say some words? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, very, very good. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you for that. Mr. Uh, Vice Chair, uh, Madam County Manager, Commissioners, um, we thank you for that uh, acknowledgement. Um, it has been another banner year at communications, emergency communications. Uh, just to give you some idea, we have taken 400,000 calls over a five year period without any significant liability claims. And that speaks volumes to our personnel. They have tough jobs uh, and our employees in the county out here are tough as nails. So. I can assure you that uh, through our quality assurance program, our training program, um, uh, we are uh, uh, once again, they did great things. So I appreciate the time and thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Thompson for your service. Thank you, Vice Chair Benson for bringing this um, recognition and proclamation. Madam Chair, I just want to thank Mr. Thompson as well. Um, he 
gave me a, a thorough tour of his um, facility and he runs a tight ship down there and uh, you're doing great work, Mr. Thompson, keep it up. And uh, yeah, give our love to all of your employees. Uh, appreciate that, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. And um, I just wanna send out an invitation to all, you're more than welcome to come out and see us at any time see what we're all about and uh, uh, meet some of our outstanding people. I love that, thank you. Um, Tia Blander. I'm ready. Um, Madam Chair, uh, Commissioners and Madam uh, County Manager, the Bernalillo County Board of Commissioners, um, this is a proclamation acknowledging um, National County Government Month. Whereas the nation's 3,069 counties, parishes, and boroughs serving more than 315 million Americans provide essential services to, cre to create healthy, safe, and vibrant communities. Whereas counties provide public health services, administer justice, keep communities safe, foster economic opportunities, and much more. And whereas Bernalillo County and all counties take pride in our responsibility to protect and enhance the health well-being and safety of our residents in efficient and cost-effective ways. And whereas each year since 1991, the National Association of Counties has encouraged counties to use National County Government Month to elevate awareness of county responsibilities, programs, and services. And whereas under the leadership of uh, National Association of Counties President Larry Johnson, NACO is demonstrating how counties thrive, especially in supporting residents and businesses during the coronavirus, coronavirus pandemic. And whereas despite the challenges of the present uh, and the past two years, Bernalillo County is thriving. And whereas Bernalillo County is deeply appreciative of the extraordinary efforts and resilience of its elected officials, employees, community, and government partners, businesses and residents. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Bernalillo County Board of Commissioners hereby recognizes April 2022 as National County Government Month. So, uh, and done uh, this 12th day of April 2022 in Bernalillo County and signed by all of um, the esteemed um, uh, county commissioners. Uh, I appreciate having a couple minutes to uh, talk about um, National County Government Month. As most of you know, and I hope um, some folks out there uh, listening and watching also know that county government uh, has so many services and, and programs. I mean, the number of programs and services is vast and broad. And so um, for 365 days a year, um, we're sharing information about these services and programs and initiatives with the general public. And in my work here at the county, I get to be a part of that. Um, so for, for County Government Month, um, we're doing something a little bit different. We're running um, this little social media campaign and it's a, uh, we're fun facts basically about Bernalillo County. Did you know this or that? Um, and you can, if you're following us up on Facebook or other social media platforms, you'll see those. And we also have them running in, on digital signage there at Alvarado Square. So um, check those out. Uh, there's some interesting stuff to share there. Um, I also um, want to mention that as I read in the uh, proclamation that a lot of counties um, are using can county government month this year to talk about how counties were still able to um, provide uh, the services uh, to residents during the pandemic and how um, uh, they were able to pivot and still do what needed to be done. And Bernalillo County was no exception. So as I was preparing my comments for this evening, I thought about um, a really good report that Bernalillo County put together that I would I'd like to tell the public about. Um, it's the COVID-19 year in review, Bernalillo County's response to a public health um, emergency. And you can find that on burnhole.gov on the emergency management page. And really the information in there, I think the citizens of Bernalillo County would be proud to read and how um, it's county government, Bernalillo County still managed to um, provide the 
uh, the daily services that uh, constituents were used to receiving before the pandemic we still managed to figure out how to do that and then take on some additional um, services. Um, for example, get the shot campaign and some of the other things that we did that um, was in response to the pandemic. So just wanted to mention that. And again, thank you for um, allowing me this opportunity to um, just highlight National County Government Month. Thank you, Ms. Tia Bland. And um, yeah, what a great recognition. I learned so much. I learned so much all the time. I was just talking with Ms. Shirley Reagan this morning about state constitution requirements that we have to have a hospital and we have to run the jet. Like those are things I don't think everyone understands that we are responsible for and by the constitution. So I'm excited and I will try and share out those posts and bring more recognition. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we'll be moving to item number five, board appointments. And um, we have Commissioner Piscotti with the um, Detention Facility Oversight Advisory Board appointment. Thank you. Um, I see my person, Gary Coffin, is on. Um, Gary, can you turn your camera on? Maybe you can't, but <laughs> oh, I, I just, oh, there you are. So, yeah, I just want to say that I... Um, I'm always impressed with the people that we get to step up to serve on our boards. Um, for the Detention Facilities Oversight Advisory Board, I thought of Gary because I knew that he had a lot of good experience. He is a U.S. Navy veteran. He graduated from UNM Law School, and he now works as a community prosecutor for the Bernalillo County District Attorney's Office. But I wanted him to be in this meeting to kind of fill in the story in the middle. Because it really speaks, it's, it's unique. He is so uniquely qualified for this position that um, this is the position that oversees and advises um, regarding MDC. So Gary, if you could just spend a, a minute or two about your lived experience with MDC, I think it would fascinate people. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Madam Chair and uh, uh, Commissioners, um, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity um, to speak uh, briefly this evening. I um, am a disabled veteran. Uh, I graduated high school in 1996 and uh, joined the military pretty much right out of high school. Um, when I returned home from Hawaii, uh, I found myself suffering from well, a, lot of, a lot of symptoms that other, other veterans find themselves suffering. Um, I didn't know exactly how to deal with them at the time. And uh, some of my lived experiences um, wound me up homeless um, for a period of time. And I did find myself living in MDC for close to a year. Uh, I have seven years in recovery um, and have done a lot. And I live a life of service at this time. I mean, really my amends to the community uh, for some of the things I've done um, are constant. Uh, you, you can't um, wrong rights from, from many, many years ago, but what you can do is, is live a life of service. And so I formed a local um, political nonprofit uh, who educates the community. Um, it was Indivisible Knob Hill, now it's named Indivisible Albuquerque. Uh, I was able to graduate law school. Um, me and my wife uh, married, purchased a home, um, and have done a great deal to um, repair our life. And so I'm honored um, to be uh, appointed to serve on a board that oversees an institution that um, I'm very familiar with. Um, I have living knowledge of, of, of working knowledge of how MDC operated at least 10 years ago. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm honored to be considered. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Um, and yeah, I think with just your lived experience and everything that you've been through and you know where you are today, it just, I think it speaks volumes about your your own persistence, but also the possibility of success for others. And so um, I am proud to move to approve your your nomination um, to be on the DF <laughs> DFOA board, the Detention Facilities Oversight Advisory Board. So is there a second? Second. Second enthusiastically. Thank you. 
Um, great. I want to say just a few words. Gary, I'm so grateful. And then Commissioner Piscotti, thank you for this appointment. I think this is so, um, Gary, um, just to add to the already great work said about you, right, that um, he knocked doors with me when we were holding that block party at Endorphin Power Company right there across from the CARES campus. Um, a lot of people don't want to knock doors in our neighborhoods, and he was there knocking doors with me and informing community about the block party that we were going to be holding. So I'm excited about what you'll bring to this um, team. Thank you for, for um, wanting to serve even farther. Thank you very um, much. Thank you. Any other um, any questions, comments? Um, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. O'Malley. Yes. Mr. Casada. Oh, Commissioner Casada dropped off, I think. Oh, okay. he'll be to... back. Commissioner Piscotti. Aye. Vice Chair Benson. Aye. And Mr. Coffin, uh, well done. I appreciate hearing your story and look forward to working with you. Thank you. Madam Chair Barboa. Uh, aye. Thank you. Um, Welcome, Gary. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Yes, great. And we have another board appointment. This time, Mr. Um, Commissioner Quesada, who I think is off. Um, he was a Sheriff's Office, Office Advisory and Review Board appointment. Madam Chair, uh, we can um, come back to this item to see if Commissioner Quesada can rejoin us. And then I can remind you all um, when he, if he does get to jump back on, and if not, then we can jump back um, towards the end of the meeting, before the end of the meeting. Perfect, thank you. Oops, um, great. So next um, item is public comment and communications. Julie Baca, is there any um, one signed up for public comment? Yes, Madam Chair, we actually have three who have signed up. Um, Mr. Louis Tapia, Mr. James Maestas and Ms. Uh, Maciara Ogin. Um, but it does look like we only have Mr. Louis and Mr. James Maestas on. Okay, thank you. Um, you will, public comment, thank you for signing up. You will have 90 seconds to share your comments. You will then be notified when your time is up. You will then be muted and moved to the waiting room. Should any of the commissioners have follow-up questions to your comments, you will have an opportunity to answer. Um, Mr. Tapia, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to, uh, at this administrative meeting. I am a resident of the South Valley Parito community, and I produce grass hay on three acres of land. I take pride in my work and strive to produce good grass hay for my buyers. In doing so, I attend seminars sponsored by the New Mexico State University Valencia County Extension Service to learn trends and, and advances in crop management related to irrigation. I am in total disagreement with Commissioner Quesada's comment that farmers are the biggest wasters of water. Rather than putting the blame on farmers, he needs to support efficient methods of delivering water to the farmer. Asikas are important to New Mexicans. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tapia. My grandpa Alfred Barboa is on Tapia Road as well, or was, is our family's <laughs> house. <laughs> Um, thank you for your comments. You're welcome. Um, uh, Mr. James Maestas. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman, for this opportunity to uh, uh, speak to you and the commission members. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I also uh, uh, are, am concerned uh, with uh, Commissioner Quesada's uh, comments to the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority uh, last week. And uh, I would like to uh, uh, say that I've submitted uh, for written comments uh, to the commission uh, regarding the efforts of the Middle Rio Grande to improve uh, delivery uh, of uh, irrigation water, uh, especially this season. Uh, we are only diverting 50% of our allocation uh, from the Rio Grande in order to try to keep it wet. Uh, also, uh, uh, we have a farm efficiency program 
that uh, uh, provides uh, funding uh, to uh, local farmers and irrigators uh, to improve uh, the delivery of water uh, to their fields. Uh, in particular, there's a uh, farm pad uh, that uh, can improve delivery to one acre uh, from four hours to one hour that are presently being uh, uh, put to use. Uh, our only limitation is funding. Uh, a third program that uh, uh, the district has initiated uh, is uh, a fallowing for both environmental purposes and, uh, and to uh, save water. Uh, as of uh, today, 230 irrigators uh, have applied for the program. Uh, they would follow their meals uh, for the remainder of the season. Uh, that's anywhere between 2,200 and 2,500 acres. Uh, a lot more uh, funding is available. In fact, uh, $15 million was appropriated by the legislature this uh, past season. However, uh, farmers like to farm. Uh, so, uh, so not that many people have participated. Uh, along those uh, same lines, uh, last year, with the uh, help of our uh, state legislator, uh, Andres uh, Romero, uh, we have uh, obtained capital outlay funds and removed uh, four cottonwoods and uh, uh, five stemmed uh, uh, elm tree from our local acequia to, uh, to improve the irrigation uh, time and efficiency. So, uh, so these are examples of, uh, of what we're trying to do. And, uh, and we would appreciate the support of the uh, county commission in, uh, in continuing to do this. Uh, two years ago, uh, Commissioner Casada had uh, initiated a, a sequia and agriculture uh, committee uh, in accordance with the Southwest Area Plan uh, to be a standing committee for the future. Unfortunately, COVID interrupted those efforts. Uh, Commissioner O'Malley participated in it. The uh, uh, MRGCD participated in uh, local acequias and the acequias at uh, Cardwell uh, on the San Antonio acequia in, in the canyon also participated uh, in these committees and the local seconds in the South Valley. So, uh, so we would appreciate uh, resuming these uh, activities and working closely with the uh, uh, county to keep our valley green. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you so much for your comments, James Maestas and um, Mr. Tapia. You are on record and we have heard you loud and clear. Any other comments? Um, Julianne? Uh, that will conclude public comment. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, we will move on to approval of the minutes. Um, I move to approve the March 22nd, 2022 budget hearing meeting minutes. Can I please have a second? Second. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner O'Malley. Yes. Commissioner Casada. Commissioner Piscotti. Aye. Vice Chair Benson. Yes. Madam Chair Barboa. Yes. So called. Thank you. Minutes approved. Um, now for the minutes of the March 29th. 2022 administrative meeting. I move to approve um, the March 29th administrative meeting minutes. Can I have a second? Second. second. Thank you, Commissioner Piscotti. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner O'Malley. Yes. Commissioner Casada. Commissioner Piscotti. Aye. Vice Chair Benson. Yes. Madam Chair Barboa. Yes. So called. Thank you. Those minutes approved. We'll move on to item number eight, approval of the consent agenda. Um, the consent agenda has been posted, publicly displayed. Um, I move to approve the consent agenda. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner Pascotti. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner O'Malley. Yes. Mr. <clears throat> Casada. Commissioner Piscotti. Aye. Vice Chair Benson. 
Aye. Madam Chair Barboa. Aye. Thank you, so moved. Um, moving on to item number nine, adoption of ordinance, um, planning and development services. We have a presentation by Director Lucas Tafuea um, for the scrap tire ordinance revisions. Good evening, uh, Madam Chair, Commissioners. This is Lucas Tafuea with the Planning and Development Services Department. Uh, our department is requesting a motion to introduce updates to the scrap tire ordinance. The primary motivation for the proposed changes are to provide scrap tire generators more options than are currently allowed under the ordinance. Uh, the original scrap tire ordinance was initiated by Commissioner De La Cruz about seven years ago to curb the occurrence of legal dumping. Uh, under that ordinance, tire shops uh, are required to purchase a tire cutter so that the tires can be cut up before they uh, are put into a, a dumpster and taken to the landfill. Uh, that's an economical solution to scrap tire management um, because uh, whole tires can't go into the, directly into the landfill because over time they'll, they'll float back to the surface and uh, cause some management problems. The amendment ord ordinance would allow uh, scrap tire generators the option to have an agreement with a scrap tire hauler licensed by the New Mexico Environment Department. Uh, or self-haul as an alternative to having a scrap tire cutter on the premises. So they can have somebody haul their tires or, or haul them themselves either to a landfill or a um, recycling facility. And so there's some documentation that would be required under that, uh, whether a, an agreement with a uh, registered hauler or, uh, and or a manifest, um, they're going to have to show kind of a, um, a chain of custody for those tires to make sure that they're ending up in a, an appropriate facility. Um, we've worked with the state environment departments uh, on this language to make sure there's consistency. And we've also worked with legal um, to make sure everything looks good. Um, and I'll stand for questions. Madam Chair, I move approval. Second. Okay, thank you, Commissioner O'Malley and Commissioner Piscotti. Um, I did have a quick question. I know, thank you, Lucas. I know we talked about this before. I just want to ask, what do, do our landfills do with tires when they receive them? Are, is there? So it uh, depends on the landfill. So our, our Cerro Colorado landfill, it's uh, managed by the city of Albuquerque. Uh, if the tires are cut, then they can go directly into the landfill just like any other municipal waste because it's it's just trash at that point. Um, but if tires are uh, taken to them whole, uh, they charge a different fee because they're gonna be recycled. And so those those tires are, um, it's a, there's a contract with a recycling facility that um, takes them out of state and uh, and they're recycled. Uh, and so various, um, Various landfills handle them differently, but um, generally, if they're cut, they can go into the landfill. Thank you. Um, there's a motion on the floor. I won't ask any more questions. Um, uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. O'Malley. Yes. Mr. Casada. Mr. Piscotti. Aye. Vice Chair Benson. Aye. Madam Chair Barboa. Aye. So you called. have a... Uh, your request, Mr. Tafoya, thank you. Thank you. We move item 10, adoption resolution. Madam Clerk, please issue resolution numbers for 10A and B. Yes, ma'am. 10A1 is FR 2022-36. 10A2 is FR 2022-37. 10A3 is FR 2022-38, B1 is FR 2022-39. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, and now for um, item A, budget, um, accounting and budget director, Jackie Sanchez to present. Good evening, Madam Chair and Commissioners. My name is Jackie Sanchez, Director of Accounting and Budget. I'm here to present the fiscal year, also referred to as FY uh, 23 and 24 biennium budget for approval. 
Madam Chair, I would like to request an amendment to remove motion number four, uh, which will be presented as a separate agenda at the next Board of County Commissioners meeting. The administrative resolution was not attached to the agenda uh, packet and therefore cannot be presented uh, for approval tonight. Thank you. I so move that motion to remove. Um, can I have a second? Second. Thank you, um, Commissioner O'Malley. Um, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner O'Malley. Yes, and again, that is item 4A4. Is that what that was? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> Commissioner Casada. Oh, there. Welcome back. <laughs> Commissioner Piscotti. Aye. Vice Chair Benson. Aye. Madam Chair Barboa. Aye. Thank you. Um, and Jackie, back to you. Thank you so much. Uh, the FY23-24 biennial budget public hearing was held on March 22nd. And the proposed budget general fund and non-general funds were presented. Nothing has changed since the budget was presented at the public hearing. And so the total fiscal year 2023 expenditures budget is $901,982,135, which includes $373,980,783 for general fund and its sub funds. The general fund reflects a 6% growth over the prior fiscal year. And the Department of uh, Finance Administration, also referred to as DFA, requires a balanced budget, which we are presenting this evening. Upon your approval, um, the budget will be submitted to DFA by June 1st, 2022. This agenda consists of now six motions, which the one was removed. And I can read them at once. Uh, and Madam Chair and Commissioners can approve, or I can read them one at a time, and they can be approved after each one. Madam Chair? Yes, Commissioner O'Malley? Uh, thank you. I just have a quick question. Uh, okay, so we're, um, is there time to um, amend the budget or is it just June 1st, it's going through? Um, is that what's going on or? Right, uh, by June 1st, we do need to submit to DFA. So um, there's just the one motion uh, for, which will be going for the next uh, Board of County Commissioners meeting. Otherwise, uh, we're looking to have it approved. Um, we look to you to approve. Uh, tonight is what you're asking for approval, yes. but there, yes. since it's June 1st, it could actually possibly be deferred and we could revisit this in May and then it could go in June. Uh, I'm gonna I, defer I, that to Shirley. I'm just curious because um, I, I was just wondering if there was time, I mean, to really look at the budget and you know, if we wanted to amend it in some way. I mean, it just seems like it's just all of a sudden in front of us, but maybe I should have been paying more attention. Um, Madam Chair, Commissioner O'Malley, um, we did reach out to um, each of you and then held the public hearings and did some follow up. But if we, um, the reason we bring the budget as early as it is, uh, at this time, there's a lot of detailed work that we have to input into the state Department of Finance and Administration system for the budget. And it constitutionally has to be there by June 1st because they spend the entire month of June analyzing all of our budget, our debt, our um, revenue projections to ensure that we would be able to operate uh, business come July 1st for the fiscal year. So it takes staff quite a bit of time to get all of that information into the system by July 1st, I mean, by June 1st, which is why we bring it as early as we do 
Um, okay, well, so I guess what I'm wondering is, is it, <clears throat> if we defer it for a couple of weeks, then when's the next meeting? Julianne, when is our next commission meeting? Yeah, so it's good for us. Two weeks. Yeah, <laughs> twenty-six. I'm sorry, April twenty-six. April twenty-six. So we have like you have the whole month of May to to basically enter this in if you add part. Yeah, I guess I. <clears throat> I guess if there was, it just seems like it just happened all at once, and I, you know, and maybe uh, it would be nice to have some more time. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, did you have something follow up, Ms. Reagan? No, I, I just didn't take my hand down. I, I was just, we, I just didn't take my hand down. Okay, thank you. Um, Vice Chair Benson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Reagan, uh, just for my own education in the constitutional process, what happens if, let's say, a county didn't have their act together and didn't present uh, by June 1st? What's the, like, what's the process at that point? Uh, if DFA didn't, uh, didn't have enough time to get the, to do their analysis, I, I would assume that we would not, they would not approve for us to operate come July 1st. And we would have to um, seek permission to use uh, emergency funds like our reserves. But I'll defer to uh, our attorney, uh, Ken Martinez, And uh, Madam Chair and Commissioner, Shirley's right. We would have to go through a process with them uh, not being in compliance. Uh, the end result of that, if you got to a huge non-compliance, is the state would come in and take over the running of the fiscal part of the county. That uh, doesn't happen, but it's happened to some local governments uh, who don't uh, comply with the deadlines. We would certainly be in front of it you know, if we were having any problems. Um, Commissioner Piscotti. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just spoke with Shirley yesterday and I asked her about that um, as things change, can we make amendments to the budget? And she said that, yes, that's what those FR things are that we vote on sometimes. So. Um, I, I talked with Shirley, I, ta I know I talked with Ken Martinez a few days ago about budget. Um, and so, yeah, it seems to be, you know, a general plan and that it can be amended as kind of as we go along. So um, I have no problem voting on this and approving this tonight, knowing that we can amend it going forward as things might come up. Thank you. Thank you for that insight, Commissioner Piscotti. Yes, um, Ms. Shirley Reagan. Yes, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioner Piscotti, you are correct. So throughout the year, the budget that we submit here on June that has to be at, at DFA on June the 1st is our preliminary budget in their eyes because we still have to true up to fiscal 22 year-end balances and carryovers. So we do that. Typically, we come back in September with another agenda item to true up the budget. We also, um, anytime we have the quarterly updates and anytime there's a financial resolution, uh, that is basically a change or an adjustment to the budget. And that also has to be filed with uh, DFA on a monthly basis as those come across or a quarterly basis. We have to submit all of those changes in the in, in detail to them as well. So those are the opportunities that I was talking with Commissioner Piscotti about being able to make changes to, to items. Yes, Commissioner, uh, Vice Chair Benton. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. So what I'm wondering, I had a chance to review the um, budget with Ms. Reagan and uh, County Manager Baca but I'm wondering, would we, if we can amend the, the budget, could we approve it like tentatively tonight and then give a final stamp in two weeks? 
when we get the additional item that has to come before us anyway. Because what I'm wondering is, will the budget really be approved if that fourth item isn't in front of us tonight? Yes, it would be, um, Commissioner, because the, the financial resolutions are the ones that actually make the budget. The, uh, the item four was an administrative resolution, and it's basically saying that we would be supporting the receipt of federal funds or grant funds, which we still in turn bring those back. So if there was a federal, federal grant that we received, such as say the ARPA funds, we'd have to bring that back to you to do this. This just opens up the door for us to accept those funds and go through the process to bring them back to you for budgeting. So it's, it's an administrative resolution. The financial resolutions are actually what establish the budget. Okay, so the ARPA funds, we approve them and then they get added into the budget once we approve them? Yes, and they become a part of the non-general fund because they have their own fund uh, and have their own criteria that we have to abide by based on the grant agreement that comes out. Okay, so tonight, if we approved it, we would approve the budget for everything except for the ARPA funds, which then we would have to approve in two weeks. Except for the new ARPA funds that would come in. You've already approved the first half, 65 million last year. So that is rolled into the carryover uh, motion three, because we carry those dollars over year over year until we spend them. Um, so that's rolled into that. But yes, if, a, if when we receive the second half of the ARPA funding, we will bring an agenda item back to you for, to do that, to accept. Okay. So ultimately the, the budget will be amended once we vote in two weeks for the fourth item, for the ARPA funds. Yeah, it's going to be amended again in September as well. So yes and yes. Yes. Okay. And it's um, and it's it changes throughout the year. Anytime we have a financial resolution, so if you award an RFP, like when you awarded the RFP for the new um, H HCM system, which is a payroll HR system, there was an FR in there to uh, appropriate some funding. So that changed the budget. So anytime you do an FR, that changes the budget. So it's kind of like rolling and being adjusted as it goes along. This is the base budget that we're asking for approval now, just to get the base things going July 1st. Gotcha, gotcha. And then the, right, so it's not the full budget that we're approving tonight. It's the full base budget at this point in time. The full base which, budget, which yes. doesn't include the ARPA funds. It the includes half, funds. correct. Okay. Or any new funds that we might have out there that um, like we're getting some capital outlay, we're working on those grant funds. Um, an uh, agenda item will come forth for those next time as well. Because we just got the notification. So we're waiting on those grant agreements and we're working with Clay and um, Maria to get those um, items too, so that we can budget that money so the departments can start using those funds. We'll be ready to use those funds. So just consider this, it's kind of like, it's the base budget, it's your starting point. It covers all of the base and known expenditures at this point in time. And then as things change, we bring back various budget adjustments in various ways, whether it's awarding an RFP um, it could be just be changing, accepting grants, accepting federal funding, um, adjusting budgets, adding positions. Uh, if there's new revenue streams that come in that we would budget to increase revenue, all of those things happen throughout the year. That's why we have um, what we call our quarterly budget adjustment agenda items. And that's where we kind of capture those things that happen throughout the year. Okay, got it. But back to the question though, that um, really the, the budget vote tonight is really gonna be split into two anyway because, because of that additional item that's not in front of us. So we'll have two votes for this, this fiscal year tonight as well as two weeks from now. 
two weeks from now and then again in September to true up. September. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. But in terms of moving forward. You're saying if you deferred it from tonight is what I'm, am I understanding you, Commissioner? I'm trying to understand the process, the, the entire process, starting from what happens if it doesn't go in June 1st? Sounds like that's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, also, what happens if we were to defer it tonight? Um, if we don't defer it tonight and vote and approve it, we're still deferring an item of the budget for two weeks from now. So I'm just trying to understand the whole process. Yeah. So and then, yes, I get it. In September, we go through the right. process again. I'm with. I'm with you on that. Yeah. So again, uh, the reason we bring the budget this early is because it's it's labor intensive to enter. You have to enter every uh, line item detail by GL account, all of the information. It's pretty tedious. If we miss any of that or make any mistakes on that during that time in June 1st, when DFA starts to review, we have to make adjustments. So we're in constant contact with them. So um, to give ourselves a little bit of cushion so that we can double check all of our numbers and get back, make sure we tie out to the 373 million and the, well, the total 901 million that we have to put in into their system. We, and then we have to also do like our debt schedules and everything like that so that they can analyze our total financial picture because they decide that we've budgeted correctly and haven't falsely or unintentionally uh, inflated revenue so that we could incur more expenses. They look at that you are not covering one-time expended, excuse me, recurring expenditures with one-time funds they look at our fund balances, they look at our reserves, they look at all of that stuff. So we just try to make sure to give ourselves enough time to be accurate enough to provide them the information. The, gotcha. the, so then, the, the administrative resolution doesn't have any dollars tied to it. So it would be just an attachment. Okay. And thank you for your patience with me on these questions. No, no problem, no problem. The, so, so let's say we approve it tonight um, and then two weeks from now we approve the last ARPA funds it gets submitted on June 1st then throughout the month of June the state is then auditing the budget making sure it's clear but then they're also communicating with you if there's any changes to make and if that happens potentially we would have to approve a new budget correct uh yeah, uh, an additional, an incremental amount, yes. So I mean, if, it, if we were right. be putting forth anything, we would be meeting with them as well. Yes, Commissioner. Okay. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Vice Chair Benson. I had a quick question myself, but Commissioner O'Malley, did you wanna, go ahead. Oh, I'll go. I um I just wanted to so from this conversation and the thought around it being a base budget, it, is that um and thank you. I know we went our whole day and I I I'm actually feel a little relieved to hear that others also think it's like that I wasn't the only one feeling like oh, I wish I had a little more time to look into this. Um, I don't think through any of the fault of our team, but just the you know we have to get this done in a short amount of time. But to the um. When we say, because even the numbers that were presented to us do feel like a, a base budget, right? Like almost categorical or, um, so is there, does that mean that um, the, like the sort of uh, what I would call in the weeds or by line item, are those committed or are those flexible? Like, does that mean Elias Archuleta's public works department requests still have flexibility within them to move things around or are they like, solid committed um, of course things happen but i'm saying like in general is this what he's expecting to spend and commitments to his budget the majority of the items are fixed so if you look at salaries um, employees contractual services those are fixed in that the contract amount when we entered into them if it said it was five hundred dollars that's what that's a fixed amount so when we establish the budget we look at all of the existing expenditures that we have that are recurring 
and we carry that over and that's the first piece that comes off of the budget. So in terms of employees, um, it's the salaries and benefits, all of the contractual services, and then we look at what's, what is any incremental growth. So if there is escalation in for those contracts, we have to account for that. So for your question about um, Elias, his base budget gives him everything he needs to do to continue his daily operations. So for his staff to come in, for them, if or more or more had some, if there was a snow to be moved in the East Mountains or whatever the transfer station, all of his normal operations, technical services, that's what the budget covers for all of us, for you, for you all, for your staff, for the other elected officials, the sheriff's department, everybody, it covers their base functions that they do. Thank you so much. And thank you for letting me use you as an example, Mr. Arch. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Commissioner, can I can, I'm happy, you know, I know that we set up time on everybody's calendar and I know that we've, we've supplied a lot of information and gave you big, thick books. Um, we're, I'm happy to sit down again and walk over everything in detail because it is quite tedious. It is, I mean, we spent several retreats with the DCMs and the county managers looking at our individual department budgets, talking with the other elected officials, seeing what their budgets were. So when they did come to that public hearing, they were familiar with what was in their budget and how it was going to be spent. And if there was new requests in there, they were familiar with what, what those were. You know, There were some additional positions that were added. Uh, we had to add some additional contracts in IT for cyber uh, security. And then costs went up related to cybersecurity. So those were, you know, accounted for some of the contract increases as well. Um, but if you look at like that, the, the resolution that we took out, um, it basically is it's, it's just to support the projects that we're, they're going to enter into and allow them the, the grant representatives for the county to submit any documents pertaining to a project. So like for Maria Encinas, when she can submit work to the state to get the CIP uh, documents so we can get the grant agreements back for um, those funds. So that's kind of what it does there. Thank you. Um, Commissioner O'Malley. Thank you, Madam Chair. During the budget hearings, uh, <clears throat> as you will recall, it brought up the uh, issue of sports in the uh, department of, um, I guess that's under the um, uh, department, I know that, let's see, what would it be, um, Parks, Parks and Rec. Rec. Parks and Rec. And we had talked about the importance of making sure that the programs um, for especially youth uh, folks, youth in the, in the teams that <clears throat> they were, the fees were high. Uh, and, you know, either free, I, you know, that's would be my thing is, you know, they, they should be free to kids who are low to moderate income kids. Is that, does that, those kinds of comments, are they reflected in this budget in the, for instance, of Parks and Rec, are they reflected in that? Like, that's not income that they can expect based on that? Or does that require an ordinance to change, um, you know, that, that fee structure? I will defer to um, DCM Grady. I think there some of them are by ordinance and some of them are not by ordinance. They're um, just fees that we charge. And I know that Parks and Rec is is um, sensitive to those and offer scale down fees. But any fee changes or charges come before you all for approval before they're they're changed. And I don't believe that anything has increased um, from what I can recall in the budget. No, it hasn't increased. The issue was that we wanted it to, uh, well, I certainly did, wanted to decrease because this was the big issue for kids who cannot afford the fees for sports. So, um, okay, may, that probably needs to be a, a, an ordinance or we need to amend the ordinance regarding fees. I think you, so I guess my issue is I've never like, dug deep into the budget in terms of like positions and things like that, because I'm just assuming that, yes, some of those are very, um, 
those kinds of items, right, are not flexible. I mean, this is what you need. You've, you've committed these positions and they're reoccurring. Where is the flexibility in the budget? Because when you talked to us earlier, you said, well, you know, if you guys have any concerns or want to amend the budget and, you know, so where is that flexibility in the budget? The flexibility in the budget comes in in two sources. One, when we're looking at revenue projections, so any new revenue that is above the existing obligations, that's part of the flexibility. The second flexibility is if you want it to reduce something, so you would do a trade-off. So if I decided not to enter into a certain contract to trade off to do something different. So that's where, that's the flexibility in the budget, primarily with new revenue. So that's why when we meet with the county manager and the deputy county managers, we kind of look at what's out there and what, what do we want to do? What's our common goal and what's our, our priorities for this fiscal year? And those are the things that we try to uh, tackle or take on incrementally based on the increase in the revenue projections. Thank and you. Our, and, our, and our large, yes, and, and, and Commissioner Malley, our large revenue sources that we look at primarily are gross receipts tax and property taxes, mm -hmm. because the others are pretty small, even fees are pretty small. Commissioner O'Malley, did you have more? So, <laughs> well, I wanted to um, just note, yeah. Is there, do I have a motion? I'll move to approve. Madam Chair, for clarity, um, Commissioner Pascotti is the motion to approve in its entirety, or are we doing resolution by resolution? Oh, yes, that was the, also the option. Yeah, I was moving to approve all items except four, which is deferred. Thank you. Thank you. I second that. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Please call the roll. You're on mute, Madam Clerk. Commissioner O'Malley. Yes. Mr. Casada. Aye. Mr. Piscotti. Aye. Vice Chair Benson. Aye. Madam Chair Barbola. Aye. Thank you. Thank you to our team for all the work and all the um, work to get us information. All right. We move on to item uh, 10B, human resources, and we have um, talent manager, manager Cynthia Weasel there to present. Good evening, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, as she said, my name is Cindy Wieselbear. I am the manager of talent management in HR, and I'm here requesting approval for financial resolution budgeting funding from the New Mexico Public Education Department in the amount of $858,708.84 to support the hire of summer interns in fiscal years 2022 and 2023 as well as um, the authorization of the county manager to execute agreements and future agreement amendments with the New Mexico Public Education Department for summer intern grant. <clears throat> Are there any questions that I might answer for you? Thank you, Ms. Elizabeth. I had a question. If, is there any other commissioners have a... I just wanted to, um, I, I read some of the things that I'm excited about this. I was a, uh, I worked for the county rec, summer rec program. So I think all those opportunities for young people are great. Is there, um, is there an age, does it have to be high school youth in this program? We have focused on high school aged youth. Yes, um, that we have the age range from 16 to 18. And they, as long as they reside within Bernalillo County, they are eligible for our program. Thank you. And and does it and it um where do the interns go? 
like anywhere? I know we got requests and I think I requested, but is there, is it anywhere? Is it any county program or is it also available to like partner and community organizations? Or? We have a variety. We both have internal to Bernalillo County and we have external to Bernalillo County. Um, some government agencies, some nonprofits, some for-profits. Um, the real goal here is to get the students real world exposure and experience in a job um, especially those that are more high in demand and help them to grow their skills of employability. So we use both. Mm -hmm. Right now we have 53 employers um, offering positions or 50 positions, 53 positions, I should say, some of them with multiple. So. Thank you. My last, I love this idea. Definitely support it for 16 to 18 year olds. I always think of that just because I worked in transitional living with youth that you know, right, those ages like 18 to 22, if they're not on a educational path or career path, like already like trade or something, then they're sort of in limbo. And I wish we could, because sometimes they'll apply for this kind of job and they won't qualify for this. And then, but if they applied they in the regular pool, they'd be in competition with people who have more experience than them. So I feel like, that, but not that that's for you to solve. <laughs> I just wanted to make that comment. Madam Chair, I, I will say that we are we are looking at internship in HR, not specific to the summer intern program, but more in a broad sense, and how we can use that to fill some of those gaps and not just have it for college interns and create a career path out of it that brings someone, you know, through that internship program and then into a regular position if they're a good fit. So we are we are exploring those, but that will be something in the future. Thank you. You're welcome. Madam Chair. Yes, oh. Commissioner Malley. No, I was just gonna say that this is uh, really good to hear um, to get this grant, uh, as you said, that there's a real need uh, for employment in this particular uh, age, that range. So I mean, I'm very supportive of it. and. I'd like to move approval. Thank you, Commissioner, Vice Chair Benson. Yeah, uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to second that, but uh, in discussion, uh, Ms. Weaselbear, did you, uh, looks like from the letter from Mr. Uh, Dusky that it was addressed directly to you. Did you apply for this grant? Last year, yes. So we did this last year, um, we got, fairly late notice of it, um, but we did, we were approved. This year, we did not have to reapply. We um, just submitted a new budget and that was all that was required for us to do it again this year. That's great. Uh, well done and this looks like a great opportunity. So thank you. Yes, I do second it after uh, Commissioner O'Malley. Thank you, um, no further discussion. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner O'Malley. Yes. Commissioner Piscotti. Aye. Commissioner Casada. Aye. Vice Chair Benson. Aye. Madam Chair Barboa. Aye. So called. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, you have your approval. Thank you for your work, Ms. Weaselbear. Thank you very uh, much, everybody. Thank you. I'm moving on to item number 11, approvals. We have Fleet and Facilities Management, FFM Director, Jared Divitt to present. Thank you, Jared, welcome. Thank Madam you, Chair, if I can just interrupt for one second. I'm not sure if we wanna go back to Commissioner Casada's sponsored item in the event he gets cut off again. Thank you. Um, yes, Commissioner Kiss. sorry, Mr. Divitt, if you can hold on one more. Psych, just kidding, <laughs> Commissioner Casada. Um, we we um, we lost you for that second when we were going to go to your proclamation. Would you like to present that now? Awesome, Commissioner Casada. Uh, it's a um, sorry, it's a board appointment. A board appointment. To, sorry, yeah. I have a board appointment. Um, I think you all, um, and I don't I don't have his resume in front of me because I had to switch to my phone for whatever reason. I laptop lost connection and wouldn't reconnect um and so i have it on my phone so i think uh we've all um got, got a chance to look at um uh, joseph uh, lopez's uh, resume um 
Uh, you know, I think that uh, I'm very, I'm very proud uh, to nominate him. As you can tell, he has long experiences in public safety. Um, we know that he comes from the firefighter's mindset, but you know, I think that in a lot, in a, in a lot of ways, they co-mingle when they respond to what's happening in our community and public safety. And and I think his voice would be a very strong voice in the sheriff's uh, advisory committee. And and with that being said, I, I hope that he did get approved. Uh, he got the thumbs up. And uh, if he didn't, then I move for it for his approval. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Commissioner Quesada. We wanted to wait so that you could present. Um, so yes, I second that. Um, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. O'Malley. Yes. Mr. Piscotti. Aye. Mr. Quesada. Aye. <laughs> Vice Chair Benson. Aye. Madam Chair Barboa. Aye. So Thank proud. you. Welcome, Mr. Joseph Lopez. Thank you for your service. I'm excited to see that board getting strong folks on it. More strong. Um, thank you. Back to Mr. Jared Devitt. Please present the next item. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioners. Again, this is Jared Devitt. I'm the Director of Fleet Facilities for Bernalillo County. We want to present to you again uh, change order number 10, the Alvarado window and storefront replacement. At the request of the commission, we researched the cost of replacing the windows over a seven year phased approach and also the cost of delaying the project until the warranty period was over and then putting it out for bid. Based on that research, we're still confident that the most cost effective approach is to replace the windows as one complete project. Uh, facilities, maintenance and fleet, facilities maintenance and facilities construction staff would like to move forward with replacement of the old non-energy efficient windows on floors two through eight and the old existing storefront vestibules and floors one through two. Uh, the estimated schedule to complete the window replacements included in this change order is up to 26 months. So it's not a quick project by any means, but we will be upgrading the windows, uh, which will increase the energy efficiency of the building. Uh, therefore, they will reduce the annual operating costs of the building by approximately 7%, which is currently projected to be about $20,000 a year. Um, we're calling this a window replacement, uh, but keep in mind, this is not just the glass. We are also replacing the entire aluminum window frame, seals, and supporting structures. Uh, aluminum and a number of other precious metals are increasing in cost right now. That's why we'd like to get this done quickly. Aluminum is the greater portion of the cost of this replacement uh, in terms of materials. Staff is requesting that this item is approved as a single change order instead of individual change order packages. And this is going to allow the county to lock in the cost upon approval of the change order. If we were to parcel out the change order to several packages, it would create additional general conditions, pre-construction costs, mobilization costs, all being added to each floor or area of work. That was a, a finding in our research that if we were to split it up uh, over the course of seven years, it would increase mobilization costs and pre-construction costs every time the crews would have to come out to try and complete one of those phases. Uh, it would increase the duration and costs associated with the project. And additionally, the local window subcontractor that we've been consulting with and seeing material cost increases as high as 15% every three months. And just since this change order was presented to the commission in January, the cost of materials needed to complete this, this specific project has gone up by $62,000. So our delay in, in doing some research cost us $62,000 already, which is in line with what we are seeing in the industry. That's only a an increase of 2.4% over the last four months. So staff does request the approval to authorize the county manager to execute change order number 10, which is window and storefront replacement in the amount of $2,417,329 plus $190,364.66 in the Mexico gross receipts tax. We also like to authorize the county manager to execute future adjustments to this contract, which would include budget and funding uh, timelines. And we'd like to authorize the county manager to prove minor cost increases up to 5% or of 5% or $5,000, whichever is greater, and associated budget and schedule changes to the items approved, uh, which will be included in change order number 10. And any changes to the cost exceeding the above thresholds will be brought before the commission for consideration and approval. I stand for questions. Yes, um, Commissioner Piscotti. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jared, for the presentation. I appreciate um, you doing the research and the numbers. 
Um, I, again, I have to say I, I'm having um, my doubts about this because, you know, even though I understand it, I understand the financials behind it, all that. I, I know when I calculated it out last time, it would take about 127 years for the win to get the return on investment um, from the energy savings. And so, you know, just from a policy perspective and priorities, um, this, this morning I met with the Canyon de Carnway land grant um, community and they desperately need water. And um, to build that pipeline out is millions and millions of dollars. And so I'd rather see you know, this $3 million go into fresh water pipelines. Um, also, I, I know that, you know, right outside those windows on the streets, people are sleeping. I'd rather put that money into affordable housing. Um, I'd rather put it into public safety, frontline workers, and, um, you know, just lots of other things. So um, even though I, I appreciate the work that you've done, and I understand the financials of it. You know, I understand that you're making a good argument. It's just not where my priorities and my heart lie. Um, and yeah, I, I appreciate it. I, I, again, I won't support this <laughs> um, because for me, there's just bigger priorities out there. And just because you can do something, I think doesn't mean you should. Um, it's like, you know, you don't have to always buy something from those, the dollar row in Target um, and then get it home and realize you didn't really need it. You could have spent that money on something else. So, um, so thank you for just letting me um, communicate my, my thoughts and feelings on this. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Piscotti. Commissioner Vice Chair Benson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. DeVette, for the report and for doing the homework that uh, we asked of you. And uh, the what concerns me is the um, in the economic environment is the um, general inflation, kind of like what you were saying earlier. Uh, it came out, it was reported today at 8.5. It hasn't been this high since 1981. And honestly, that's probably a bogus number. It should be higher. Uh, nothing's gone up only 8% in the last year. Uh, nothing that I'm aware of. And if you go to the grocery store, the gas station, rent, everything's gone up 10 to 20% to 50%. So, um, yeah, my concern is that uh, this is, you know, we're stewards of the entire county. This is one of the items, as well as the water lines that Commissioner Piscotti is talking about. But uh, this has to get done. And if we don't operate, if we don't move now, my concern is that it's going to cost taxpayers more um, and we're, we're going to have to do it. I mean, we're going to, we have to take care of the building. So um, yeah, that kind of answers my question, uh, increasing, uh, getting a certain cost now or increasing that cost by $600,000. Um, the math makes sense to me. So thank you for the homework. Madam Chair, you're on mute. I was thinking everybody, any further discussion? Thank you, Commissioner Piscotti. Um, do I have a motion? I'll, I'll make a motion if nobody else wants to. I move approval. <clears throat> second. I'll second. Thank you, Commissioner O'Malley and um, and for the second, whoever you choose, Julie, look like Commissioner Casada and Vice Chair Benson both were in there. Um, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner O'Malley. Yes. Commissioner Casada. Aye. Commissioner Piscotti. No. Vice Chair Benson. Aye. Madam Chair Barboa. Aye. So call. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Divet. Divet, hope I'm saying it right. Um, on to item 11B, 
We have um, Live Nation Worldwide Special Projects Coordinator Diane Chavez to present. Good evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my name is Diane Chavez, Special Projects Coordinator for the General Services Division. And I'm before you with a motion to allow county manager to approve and um, the services agreement for Live Nation for services for law enforcement and traffic control for all events held um, for the 2022 to 2027 concert season at the Sleda Amphitheater. Um, this motion is also to allow the county manager to execute and sign any subsequent amendments. I will stand for questions. Thank you, Ms. Sanchez. If um, just for instance, like what is, because I know um, I live in the area where all these events happen and officers are always there, whether it's APD or BSSO, um, BCSO. If, and I'm always wondering, like when we have shortage of officers in the field, what does it mean to have officers work? Or I, I did a lot of work with um, officers and there was pieces around like that officers are, you know, working almost mandatory overtime. And then that means like, what are they by their fourth day? Are they really alert enough to, um, for themselves or their own selves and to, to serve community? So I guess, does they, what happens if these contracts aren't approved or how do you, like, I guess, what does that mean? Um, when we're hearing that on some sides and then this contract is us providing or we're receiving funds right for um, from Live Nation for BCSO officers to be able to provide these protective services during concerts or events right. Correct, correct Madam Chair. Um, we do have a provision the the contract is not fully uh, negotiated but we have included language that says if the Bernalillo County Sheriff's Department is unable to perform the services, they can go elsewhere. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, discussion? Thank you, Ms. Chavez, do I have a motion? I move for approval. Thank you, Commissioner. No Thank you, Commissioner Piscotti. Um, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner O'Malley. Yes. Commissioner Casada. Aye. Commissioner Piscotti. Aye. Vice Chair Benson. Aye. Madam Chair Barboa. Aye. So call. Thank you. Um, we move on to items 12, discussion. So these are just discussion items. Operation Excellence Office, Bernalillo County Strategic Plan, um, OEO Manager Maria Zuniga to present the fiscal year 23-24 strategic plan. Good evening, uh, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Um, as mentioned, my name is Maria Zuniga. I'm the manager of the Operations Excellence Office here at the county. Here with, the, here with me this evening is also Laurel Johnson. She is a college intern that works in our office um, as she seeks her master's degree at UNM. She's going to be sharing her screen. So I'll give her just a moment to go ahead and do that. Make sure that comes through okay. Can you see it, everybody? Yeah, that looks good to me. Hold on, let me just organize my view a little bit. Apologies for that. Okay, so let me get a little bit smaller. Okay, um, so I'm excited to present to you this evening the updates to the county strategic plan. So as you know, effective strategic planning is our guide into the future and is expected of us from county residents. So just so you know, everything in this strategic plan was built as part of a collaborative process where we obtain, obtained input from all county departments, elected officials, and leaders. Some of the pillars um, on which we built this strategic plan are to be actionable, transparent, accessible, easy to use, and easy to understand. Please note that this plan is also built in accordance with leading practices from professional organizations, such as the International City County Management Association and the Government Financers, Finance Officers Association, and is in alignment with their recommended practices of aligning <clears throat> the strategic plan to the fiscal priorities of the county. 
Okay. So with that, I'm going to show you this strategic plan framework. So this is used by the county and made up of the several components that you see on this graphic, which are interconnected um, and they kind of impact each other in both the top down and bottom up way. Um, I'll go ahead and start with our why, um, which consists of our vision, mission and values. So the vision basically at a high level establishes the intended future for the county. Whereas our mission articulates our basic purpose. Uh, values are the standards by which uh, we accomplish that mission and vision. So we'll go ahead and show you the newly developed vision, mission, and values included in the strategic plan. Again, this was all built um, with input directly from county leaders, departments, and elected officials. So our vision, again, of what, is we, what we aspire to become in the future is inspirational and should appeal to our county residents. Um, it's listed on this slide in the orange box on the bottom that's circled in red. And I'll just go ahead and read it to you. It's a resilient, healthy, safe community with a vibrant economy, rich in opportunities that provides the best quality of life now and for future generations. Okay. With that, we can go ahead and move on to our mission. So again, this is the basic purpose um, that explains concisely why we exist. Again, listed kind of on the bottom of the slide, circled in the red box. I'll go ahead and read it again. Provide welcoming, professional, exceptional public service to the community we serve. And with that, on our next slide, we have our values. So these create the standards by which we accomplish that mission and vision. So these are focused on guiding county workforce and leadership as we make decisions. Um, again, listed on this uh, slide towards the bottom. Sorry about this. Hold on one second. My dog was <laughs> my dog was needing me. Sorry. <laughs> Apologies for that. Um, again, now we have I forgot what it's like to be remote. I'm like, oh, <laughs> should have stayed in the office. No, okay. Um, sorry, I lost my spot here. We are on. Oh, the values, okay, the values. I'm um, we'll going to read those to you guys. Being ethically and fiscally responsible, ensuring that we are adaptable and responsive. I mean, it's also important that we have a good balance between work and life so that we can provide that exceptional service in accordance with our mission. Having a diverse workforce is also one of our core values um, as an organization. And last but not least, transparent communication is very important to us as well. All right. So we'll move kind of to the next major component of our strategic plan, which we call our what. So here we start with assessing the current situation. This is where we analyze the various factors influencing the potential success or failures to achieving the mission and vision. So this drives, the outcome of this drives our strategic goals, which are the major milestones, major milestones towards achieving the mission and vision. So within those uh, strategic goals are the focus areas. And these capture at a very high level the ways we will achieve those strategic goals over the next few years. We'll go ahead and give you a little bit closer look here into how we assess the current situation. So we have a slide here that shows you the four SWOT type of questions, SWOT being focusing on strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats that we ask each and every department, and elected official and county leadership to respond to. So here we ask them four basic questions. What is going well? What is not going well? And both of those questions are internally focused on what the department is facing. Then we ask them a couple more questions that are externally facing. So what opportunities do they see that the county could take advantage of? And converse to that, what challenges we are facing? Um, so the most important part of this process isn't just identifying the opportunities and challenges and what's going well, not going well, but also asking the department for what they think we could do to prepare for this. So that's the, the planning part, the long-term strategic planning part. And likewise, what resources they might need to achieve those. All right. So here, this next slide, um, you might remember the green bubbles from the public hearings a few weeks ago. <laughs> I'll try and put these in context here. So what we did is basically we got all those SWOT responses from all the departments and we had a vast array of responses, as you can imagine, given the diversity of support services we provide. Um, and we basically used all those responses to develop the focus areas. Um, so those, again, are the priorities. To achieve the goals. So we come out with, uh, and then the green bubbles are basically all the, again, the responses from the SWOT, the objectives, the, the ways uh, the department's looking to achieve the strategic plan goals for the county. 
So we came out with 22 focus areas within five strategic plan goals, which I'll show you in a minute on the next slide. But these were developed from over 600 SWOT responses. Um, and again, kind of tie back to all those very detailed things each and every department is doing to achieve um, the strategic plan over the next couple of years. So their projects, their initiatives, their priorities is what, what those green bubbles are all about. So with that, we're going to move on to the next slide. So this will really show you here at a high level, um, the five strategic plan goals and the focus areas in the gray boxes under each goal. And again, the focus areas are the summarized and synthesized information from that SWOT um, activity. So I'll go ahead and just quickly run through these so you get a quick look at them. Um, government accountability, this goal is about transparent and accountable delivery of services. So focus under areas under here include ensuring a competitive compensation salary. So we have, you know, to achieve retention um, and recruitment, um, adequate staffing so that we can deliver quality services and ensuring fiscal and strategic alignment among others. Next, we have strategic, I'm oh, sorry, public safety, which is our next goal. Um, this is about ensuring uh, the safety of our residents, meeting behavioral health needs. And here you'll see some focus areas ranging from being prepared for emergency to providing you know, all the things needed for the safety of our residents. Also, there's a focus on public safety staffing and programming to meet the needs within this goal. And expanding behavioral health services and improving jail outcomes are also big under this goal. Okie doke, here we have next community health. So this is about investing in changing lives and promoting health, changing lives and promoting health. Um, so there's a diverse range of focus areas under this goal, ranging from diverse recreation activities, making sure we're providing those to community housing, senior programs, and ensuring we have an engaged uh, learning opportunities um, for our youth, as well as providing indigent and community health services. Next strategic goal, public infrastructure. This is about improving and supporting quality of life by ensuring necessary transportation, drainage facilities, technology infrastructure, things like that. You'll find focus areas in here, um, definitely about ensuring technology to increase our reach to our customers, and then also supporting our fleet and facility infrastructure. Sustainable planning and improving our cybersecurity posture are also some of the priorities within this goal. Okay, last but not least, economic vitality. Here we have, um, we're trying to make, you know, the goal here is to ensure a thriving, livable community with access to diverse economic opportunities. So some of the focus areas we saw here are making sure, you know, we're kind of moving towards a regional economic development model to supporting our local art and culture and ensuring the quality of life of our residents. Okay, we're gonna move on to the last major component of our strategic plan framework which consists of objectives. Those are the major outcomes or deliverables needed to achieve the focus areas. Um, we also have here where we line the objectives or projects to the budgetary needs in that step. We have action items, which are how those objectives are achieved and performance measures, which is that detailed data used to track progress on all of the strategic plan. Okay, so this next slide, I'm gonna give you just a very quick example of an objective and a budgetary request and how it aligns to the strategic plan goal. Because I think it's probably the easiest way to kind of put it into context and make it understandable. So here we have an example on the kind of lower right-hand side of the slide. Hopefully you can see that okay. Um, and it's really about, um, align, which aligns to government accountability as a strategic plan goal. And it's achieving a couple focus areas. One of them is adequate staffing, um, investing and investing in our employees is the other one. So the budget request was from our HR department and it's about ensuring employee engagement, outreach and hiring initiatives. So there was a funding request for that. And then they have several, this department has several objectives related to this budgetary request, such as developing outreach methods for recruitment to furthering the development of the intern program, which I fully support and improving hiring processes and succession planning. So a lot going on in that one. <clears throat> and last but not least there, we see that the budgetary and objective needs will be tracked through performance measures. One example listed here is increasing applications for hard to fill positions. So that's kind of at the very detailed level how they'll track that. Okay, we can move on to the next slide. So we have the strategic plan um, book. 
which was included in your agenda package. And we've also provided some hard copies on your desk so that when you get back to the desk or your commission assistant desk, you'll see those hard copies. Definitely feel free to look through, through it and let us know, you know if you have any questions or comments or, or need any more information. But it basically, in a nutshell, it's encapsulating all of the information presented before you this evening in a little bit more detail. Um, and it gives you all the information about the goals, the terminology, explains our strategic planning process and our performance management process um, in detail. And last but not least, uh, last slide here, we have our um, strategic plan webpage. So this basically is, and there's a link to it within here. There's, you know, it's available at all time on our transparentburnco.gov website. It's basically our live interactive version of the strategic plan. So here you can provide, you can drill in by department to all of the performance measures and objectives being tracked um, by the departments and it's updated in real time. So as soon as we get the data, we load it into the system and you can see how things are going. That's why we call it our live interactive version. So you can drill, you can look at the graphs, you can drill on the graphs, get to more detail. Um, and basically it's just kind of that snapshot of how we're doing again at a very detailed level to achieve the strategic plan. So with that, I'll wrap up my presentation and I'm available if there's any questions now and definitely if there's any questions in the future, I'm available as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Maria Zunica. Any comments, questions? Thank you. I did really appreciate, thank you. Um, and thank you for being with me again this morning, but also I did appreciate that um, our, when we did get the budget, budget presentation, that they were lined up with our strategic goals. Cause oftentimes people do a strategic plan that sits on a shelf somewhere and then they never line up things to it. And so really thankful for your thinking about us seeing how we're actually putting our investments where our priorities are through our strategic plan. Um, Really appreciate it. I move, um, or this is just discussion, so I don't even need to move anything. Um, and I think we lost Commissioner Quesada and Commissioner O'Malley, perhaps. But um, Vice Chair Benton, Bishop Scotty, no comments. Um, yes, County Manager Baca. Uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners, I just wanted to say really quickly, this just shows that the, our, um, you know, our attempts, um, and more than our attempts, just all the work that staff has been put into this to, um, to, the, to tie it into the budget so that you all will know this is just kind of the why we're asking, it's how, how we're doing this. And then it holds us accountable by, um, then she's got the performance measures. So, you know, we, it, it totally holds us accountable. So it's a net, it's been a long exercise and it's been a lot of work for everybody. Um, and we appreciate the work of our great staff. Um, Shirley, thank you. Um, really appreciate Maria, Laurel, um, all your staff has done a lot of work. And I just want to give you kudos too for CJCC. Without you all, we wouldn't have a strategic plan. Uh, and we've been trying to get that done for a couple of years already. So, um, and it's really kind of gained momentum and we're getting some credibility too within the community. So thank you so much, appreciate it. I agree. Thank you team. And um, I will be diving in. I didn't realize the interactive website which seems very resourceful. So I am gonna dive into that. Um, Thank you. Um, so if there's not any other discussion, I'll announce the next commission meeting, Tuesday, April 9th, 2022. Um, we'll be have our 2022 special UNM hospital budget work session at 2 p.m. And it will be a Zoom meeting. On Tuesday, April 26, 2022, We'll have Bernalillo County Affordable Housing Nonprofit Meeting at 4.30 p.m. in Ken Sanchez Chambers. And on Tuesday, April 26th, the same day on, of 2022, we'll have our administrative meeting at 5 p.m. Ken Sanchez Chambers. Um, if there are no other business, this meeting is adjourned. And thank you, commissioners and county. <laughs>